to be light bearers, be the salt of the earth, and to uh, spread your truth. So Lord, we thank you, give you the praise, honor, and glory in all things. And just, uh, just be with us, Father. I say this in your son's holy name. Amen.
Welcome everyone. Oh well, there's a lot more people now. That's weird. Um, welcome. Just want to remind you uh, that we also worship God in our giving. So we're going to be passing the plate around. You can also give online, and as well as there's a little box in the back in the hallway. So just a reminder.
trust him when to simply trust seems the hardest thing I will trust my Savior Jesus trust him when my strength is strong for I know Shield of Jesus, here's the Savior.
trust in you alone for the for your son, for your word, God, that you are our shepherd, and Lord, that um, you never let go of us. Lord, we know that we all go through trials, and um, God, we just uh, ask that you make those defining moments for us to make us more like you, to give you a heart more after you. God, just... Uh, just work in us, Father. Please be our strength, our shield, our righteousness, and our hope. Father, we thank you. We love you. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory in all things. It's in your Son's precious and holy name, Jesus. We say these things.
mentioned at the beginning, we do have uh, Christmas Eve service here at the Falls. We have a regular service in the morning, uh, regularly scheduled time programming, 10 30 a.m., but then we're having a family service at 5. This is going to be a candlelight service. I really hope that you all can make it, bring your families. It's a great time for us to uh, reflect on why we celebrate this season. Um, you have plenty of Christmas stuff happening. We have a women's event that is happening Friday, December 15th. It'll be from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. If you have any questions, please speak with Miss Angie. Uh, she'll answer all your questions for you, um, or Katie as well. Also, um, Jerry just informed me that we have some people sign up for the gift wrapping event that we have lined up for the 16th, I believe, at the Teton Mall. Uh, he's looking for six more people uh, or three more couples to serve. Uh, this is just a way, huh? Four more, sorry. Four more couples to serve. And then um, this is just a way for us to engage the community and provide them something that they're probably seeking and then hopefully build a relationship to uh, share the gospel and the hope that is in this season of anticipation. I uh, want to bring your attention that if you call uh, Falls Church, your home, and you have decided to become a partner with us, then we invite you to a business meeting. This is for everyone who has partnered with the Falls Church to please stay after service as we're going to be uh, proposing some budgetary items coming into the new year and just giving you updates on what's going on with the church. So if you call this place your home and you have uh, assigned the, the partnership agreement and all that stuff, Please come to this meeting. We'd love to have you guys. Um, also, we have uh, we're we're migrating to a new platform called Planning Center. Uh, Planning Center has a church uh, app option, which we're going to start pumping all communication through. So, we're asking everybody that has a smartphone, just go to your Apple Store or Google Store, download the Church Planning app, and um, sorry. The, yeah, the Church Center app, I'm sorry. And um, on there, it'll just bring up this ge geographic area, and then you'll see the Falls Church logo. Just click on that, and then you guys are set up. And you'll receive communications through there, groups, uh, special events, all of that. We're going to be migrating towards that into next year and uh, just eliminating the various ways we're trying to get communication. So that will be the primary way we're communicating future events here at the church, signups, payments, and all that stuff. If you have any questions, please, you can see myself, um, I don't know if Tyler is here today, we can ask Tyler as well. And uh, starting next week, we'll be, we're finishing Ephesians today, but starting next week, we'll be going into our new series, uh, Tyler Joy to the World, as we uh, start reflecting on the ascension, I mean, the ascension, the anticipation of uh, Jesus' arrival. And uh, it will lead us up to Christmas, so please join us for that. But uh, with that, if you guys would, please stand up, meet your neighbor, tell them hello, give them a warm hug, and uh, we'll get ready for the future of today's message.
church. How are we? First time? Oh, that was good. I just had to prep you. Okay. Well, good to be with you. Um, wow. We're in December, right? Isn't that crazy? I mean, it just, like, time flies. I, I just, seems like every trip around the sun goes a little faster, doesn't it? Anyhow, well, welcome. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, we're wrapping up today. We're concluding our multiple week uh, journey through the letter um, from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus, right? And just as a way of reminder, um, we're going to go through a brief recap and then we'll, we'll jump into, you know, the text. Thank you, Cassie, for reading that. Um, but as a reminder, we're basically, re our identity, the thing Paul wants to get across is that our identity has to be first and foremost that we are children of God. Right, if you are born again, which means you have transferred trust in from yourself, right, and your own goodness, your own righteousness, and into the goodness of Christ who shed his blood on your behalf, right, and you believe and receive that by faith, he promises to be just and faithful to forgive you of your sins and adopt you as a son and daughter into his family, into the body of Christ, right? And so Paul's letter is to those people, but he also wants to make sure that they understand that um, they don't bring much to the table, <laughs> right? Like, he adopted you as a son and daughter. Like, he gave you privileges and rights by bringing you in to something that, that you didn't earn, right? And we see this heavily in in Ephesians chapter 2, where he says it's by, it's, by, uh, it's by grace that you have been saved, right? And this is by faith, right? And this is not of works so that what? So that no one can boast, right? So if, if we really have believed the gospel, it will produce in us a, a regenerated heart that is one of absolute humility, Right? We have a regenerated, humble heart, which now makes us more like Christ because we see Christ, he's sitting on the throne of heaven and he chooses to come down to earth, forsake heavenly glory to suffer on our behalf and shed his blood and have his body broken. And at the end of service today, we will remember that as we take the elements, the Lord's Supper, right? And so if all these things are true and we, then our identity really needs to be in that place, it should impact the way we live. But the church in Ephesus, it was a crazy city. There's a lot going on. There's different factions, right, just like our culture now. And, and there's, it seems that what's bubbling up is some, some divisions in the church. You know, this group of people isn't getting along with this group, right? Maybe it's the, the people that believe doctrinally this way versus a little bit this way, right? Or maybe a little different socioeconomic class or, or financial status or w whatever it is, right? And so in chapter 4, he is pleading with them, hey, Forget those distinctions and put your unity back in Christ, and that will bring about unity. And then he even goes a step further and, and gives in instructions for, the, for Christian living as it relates to households. And that's what we went through last week, right? Um, husbands, are you loving your wife the way Christ loved the church? If not, don't expect her to submit, <laughs> right? Um, however, wives... Yield willingly to your husband as you would unto the Lord, right? Children, obey your parents. There's a promise in that, right? Children, don't ex parents, don't exasperate your children, right? And so if you, if you, you know, go, go listen to that message again if you need to, if you didn't hear it. But the idea is, you know, this, this should affect the body of Christ. It should also affect our households if our identity is where it should be. And then we get into chapter six here and we end up and we're, we're wrapping up with this idea of, okay, we need to put on the armor of God, okay? And as I was thinking about this, um, I literally had like a million different examples and this, guys, I'll even say this, it's interesting how you feel the spiritual warfare when you're trying to get ready to preach on spiritual warfare, right? It's like hard time getting my thoughts organized and there's all these things I want to say and there's not enough time and, and then they're jumbled and I'm looking at my notes. I'm like, what did I just write there, right? Like, I'm just like, man, I could like almost feel the confusion, you know, uh, coming. So I really do pray that this morning's message is clear, but also I want this message this morning. Th this is really meant to be an overview for you, but take this home and go wrestle with the text prayerfully, okay? This is not a once a week you come and like I feed you with a spoon. No, I, I'm, I'm trying to put God's word on a plate for you and go home and feast on it over the week. 
okay? I, I really believe that's vital importance as it relates to this week's passage, okay? Wrestle with it. Wrestle with the text this week. And as I was also thinking about what illustrations might we use, um, I, I, I thought about this one. Um, there's a couple things that we have in our culture that it just seems like people feel like are like the, the one all cure all for everything. One is a Swiss Army knife, right? It does nothing well, but it does a little bit of everything, right? <laughs> and the other one is duct tape, <laughs> right? Like, is there anything duct tape isn't good for? Right, like I was out there, uh, you can see this, you, you people have decided as it comes to automobiles that for whatever reason, if I can't afford the body shop or I just don't have time to get there, duct tape, like that's the answer, duct tape, right? And you see here all sorts of examples of duct tape being the, the, the tool of choice, <laughs> <laughs> right, for solving a problem, but like, let's be honest, is it the right tool? Right? No, it's nothing more than a temporary patch that will fail because it's not designed for that. Right? That's not what it's designed for. Duct tape is meant to be an interim solution. It is not to meant to be the solution. Right? And so as we go into this morning's message, keep that picture of duct tape in the back of your mind, and I want you to ask yourself this question, right? Like when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to spiritual battle, when it comes to putting on the armor of God, Am I using the tools that God has put in my spiritual toolkit, right, in my wardrobe chest to where I'm going to get put on the armor, or am I grabbing duct tape out of there, right, and expecting the results that really will only come if I'm putting on the true armor of God? So let's go to the Lord in, pr the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you this morning. Uh, Lord, my thoughts this week have just been jumbled. Now, Lord, there's so much to go through. So I pray for clarity, I pray, pray for brevity, but Lord, most importantly, I pray that your Holy Spirit speaks through these words that were penned 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Paul under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church in Ephesus, but also for us right here today, 2,000 years later. Lord, I believe you have a word for many, if not all of us this morning, that in a way that we are, we are falling prey to the schemes of the enemy in some way. Lord, may we become aware of that this morning, Lord, and may we put on the full armor of God so that we can walk in the fullness of Christ. God, this prayer is not just for the church, it's for myself as well. God, I need this. Lord, I pray that you reveal to each one of us where we're exposed, where we're vulnerable. Lord, where we're believing things that are untrue. Lord, and equip us and strengthen us and restore us this morning. We ask this all in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen. So church, um, the first thing we want to do is we want to just, I, I got kind of here at the top of the, the notes, under, this is on the front of the outline, please take out your outline. If you need a pen, let someone know, hopefully you've got one, to take notes. Because I left blanks because I really felt like this morning, hopefully the text and the message is kind of hitting us each a little bit differently. Right, that as I'm speaking, as the word is going forth, the Holy Spirit is ministering to each of us exactly what we need to hear. Okay, and I have faith and I have trust that that's what he's going to do. Uh, but at the top, I, I want to start with this idea that we need to know and understand the game. Okay, this is on the front page. It's already written down. It's before the passage. That's all typed out. But this is what I want to communicate by this. Okay? Um, we, we let's ask ourselves, like, what, what is a game? And I think when we ask ourselves that, that question, it probably is not uncommon that most of us jump back to like a board game, right? Sorry, or shoots and ladders, right? Or something like that. But, but, but a game in its truest definition, it's a contest between two opposing sides or two rivals. Perhaps there's more participants than just two, but at a minimum, it's a contest between rivals, okay? And the goal of a game is always victory, superiority, to win. Right? Now, there may be other auxiliary goals, for example, if you're playing a board game with your family, right? To have fellowship, to laugh, to whatever. But at the end of the day, the, the actual objective of the game itself is to win. Um, but there's other types of games beyond just board games, you know, like Sorry or Shoots and Ladders that have really not much at stake, right? Other than, you know, maybe little, little brother gets mad at little sister or something. But we've got other games. We've got high school sports. It's a type of game, right? 
Uh, and maybe respect or ego is at stake. Uh, maybe we elevated it, we got TV games, right? Like, who wants to be a millionaire? Price is right, which my mom won, by the way, in case you were wondering. Um, uh, Survivor. Interesting game, right? It's a game. It, the, the goal is what, though? It's victory. And it includes lying and deception and sneakiness and alliances. Like, it's a complicated game. Uh, I was thinking back to the high school sports one. Um, we need to be reminded sometimes that youth sports, right? Th think of the YSCA right down here over off of Ammon Road. It says, hey, no scholarships will be given out today, right? The, the, the refs and the coaches are volunteers, so, so keep your head cool, right? Because we, we have an ability when there's competition involved that, you know, uh, temperatures can rise. What about uh, professional sports, right? This is another level of game. All of a sudden now what's at stake is millions of dollars perhaps tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions, right? So much so that you get cheating, you get violence, right? You get all these things that start to come in because of the stakes. But then think about, there's a movie that just came out, Hunger Games, right? Or War Games, right? These, these are games, this is contests, these are rivalries uh, of, um, that, that go well beyond juvenile board game ideas and really lives and civilizations are at stake. Right, anyone see the new Hunger Games movie? I did, I'm the only one. Did anyone watch the other series? Man, I'll tell you, this, this last one was good, right? It did not disappoint. So anyway, there's my little plug, go see it. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the point is, I think sometimes we as the church, um, we, we, we look at this passage on the armor of God and we think back perhaps to Sunday school when we were putting on, let's go ahead and put up this image here. Um, we, we think back to Sunday school where we had um, this idea of like, hey, putting on the armor of God is, is almost like a Halloween costume, right? Like, oh, isn't that cute? We're playing dress up. Get your sword of the spirit and your helmet of salvation and your shield and faith, you know, right? Um, yeah, but the truth is we're, we're really more in a battle where we need to think more like this, right? Like we, we are in a spiritual battle where lives, civilizations, eternity, and whatnot is at stake. This is not, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is not a costume event. This is not Halloween, right? This is real. So we need to think about it in those terms. Uh, this next one here, I don't know if you ever saw that movie. What was it? Um, Oh, Troy, right? It was terrible, actually. Terrible movie, right? But, you know, Achilles, right? He's like this, like, warrior, and he goes, and he's, you know, slaying people, right? But, like, the idea was, like, war is real. Civilizations are at stake. And so with Paul, as our general, understand that Paul had a unique perspective that I want to hope we, we, we can capture what was going on at the time, but also we can relay it into today's, you know, kind of modern context. So in Paul's day, it would have been normal that if you lived in Ephesus or a similar type village or city, you were under Roman occupation, okay? And Roman occupation basically meant that there were soldiers that were part of the Roman military that were stationed, right, in your city. And they were there to make sure that that province, that city, that whatever um, would basically submit uh, to the wishes of Rome, right? And also that it would maintain order, bring justice, all these different things. And the truth is there's a lot of people that would prefer that they weren't there. Not only that, it wasn't simply uh, like benevolence that they were there. I mean, Rome was trying to conquer and expand its territory. And so they would go into places and kill and slaughter and occupy. Right, and so the point I bring this all out though is Rome had one of the largest standing armies at one point ever to be on the face of the earth. And these, these soldiers were incredibly well trained and they were basically outfitted in top notch gear. And so when Paul, I believe, is writing this, he understands that the people that are receiving this know exactly what armor looks like because they see these soldiers walking up and down their streets stationed in this type of getup. Right, and so what he's trying to do is basically parlay, hey, you know those soldiers that you see everywhere that are the finest and the best in the land that you wouldn't dare go up against because there's 
you deal with one, you're gonna have 10 more right behind them and they've all got top training and top equipment. I want you to think, church, in, in terms of that, that you need to suit yourself up the same way for the spiritual reality that we're in. Okay. So get ready. We're going to have rapid fire here because um, we've got a lot to cover. Um, and I really hope and pray that the notes that you take home will be something that will jumpstart your conversations either with God directly or with your spouse to work through uh, some of this stuff on a further basis. So the first thing Paul says here is he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Right? Be strong in the Lord. Uh, what this really means is don't place your hope or strength in anything else. If you're going to put on the armor of God, um, first thing you, you want to do is you want to put trust in that God knows what he's doing, right? Um, and we all have a tendency um, at different points, right, to trust in something else, right? Maybe it's in money. Maybe it's in our health. Maybe it's in, um, right, our talents and abilities, whatever it is. And Paul is reminding the church immediately, hey, your strength is to be found in Christ alone, right? In God Almighty, the, the creator of heavens and earth. Um, do you think Satan is worried about going up against God Almighty or you? <laughs> right? So present yourself accordingly. I think back to like those cartoons um, we're growing up, right? Like maybe there's like a little mouse, right? And there's like a cat and he comes out and he's like marching like this and the cat's like shivering, right? It's not because of the mouse, right? It's because there's a dog behind the mouse, right? And all of a sudden the cat's ready to run. And I think of kind of like that imagery, hey, when, when, when Satan looks at you, are you standing there all alone or do you have a big ferocious watchdog behind you, which is God Almighty, right? And I think that's kind of the image, right? Like, don't enter into this battle on your own strength. Next thing we want to look at is Paul says, hey, put on the whole armor of God. He doesn't say, hey, just put on the parts that fit nicely or the parts that come conveniently, right? He says, put on the whole armor of God. Be fully prepared. It makes me think about, um, anyone here play youth sports? Anybody? Right, so I played soccer growing up, I, and I do this to this day. I'm playing soccer tonight, indoor soccer over at Starlight, and it seems like every week I forget something, right? Like I forget my shin guards, or I, I bring the wrong shoes, or whatever it is, right? And I think that's a common experience for everyone who played youth sports. I mean, you hope you grow out of it. I obviously haven't, right? I've had to borrow things. I've even used duct tape to hold my shin guards in place. Good little laugh there. Um, but I think... If we're honest, we're, we're gonna get into this a little bit, but the devil, one of his primary tactics is that he's a schemer, he's a liar, right? And he makes us think we don't need to put it all on. You'll be okay, not today. You can wait to put that on until next week, right? And Paul has called us um, basically in, in the Holy Spirit in Christ, right? Hey, suit up, put on the whole armor. Don't miss a piece. In the same way a Roman soldier would have been set back right, to the outpost to go put something back on if they'd forgotten a piece of equipment, right? We, we need to have that same mentality. Hey, every single morning when I get up, I'm in a battle. Do I, do I see it that way, and am I putting on the full armor of God? Um, why? Well, he says, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Okay, so we've got stand firm in Christ, right? Right? We've got put on the whole armor, and now we get the why. It's because there is an adversary. There's that, that's literally what the word Satan means. It means the adversary, like the opponent, the rival, right? And you, so you can stand against the schemes of that one, the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So kind of this, this third little point here is, hey, we gotta know our adversary, right? And what does Jesus call him directly? Calls him the father of lies, right? He's talking to the false religious leaders, the false teachers of the day, and he said, hey, you're spewing nonsense just like your father, the father of lies. What you're spewing is not from God Almighty, it's coming from the father of lies. You're using God's word to bring about your own agenda, but you're not actually speaking truth. 
And this is something we see Satan do regularly as a tactic. So know your enemy, know the adversary, right? He is a liar from the beginning, is what the Bible says. Okay, so what are his schemes, right? We already talked about this. They usually involve lying and deceit. In fact, when I say usually, like 99% of the time, very rarely does God allow Satan to physically afflict someone. <coughs> However, he has free reign to go lie. Why? We have the Holy Spirit. We have the, 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 um, the Bible, right? God has given us all that we need for godly living and to know truth. This is exactly what Satan did with Adam and Eve, right? He came and he, he just put a little bit of deceit in there. Oh, well, God doesn't want you to eat from that tree because you will be like God. Well, that was a true statement in the sense that they would know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, but it was a false statement in the sense that they would never really truly be like God, right? They're in the flesh. God is spirit. Um, this is the same tactic that Satan tried when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, right? He tried to twist the words of God in a deceitful way in order to basically bring about you know, a, de a result that was contrary to, to God's, God's perfect will. So I, I, this may be a question that you need to ask yourself, and I'm gonna give you kind of like a little feeder list here, guys, but by no means is this comprehensive. This is coming from the mind of Ryan, right? And, and maybe you just need to ask yourself, what lies am I, at, what am I believing? Right, before we go any further, recognize you have an adversary and maybe even ask yourself, what things am I susceptible that aren't true to believing? For example, someone that is very merciful, right, may believe that in accepting a certain type of sin is loving, even if it's contrary to God's word, right? Why? Because I, I just want to show mercy. But some of the lies, right, is God will try to convince people, or sorry, Satan will try to convince people that God doesn't exist, um, or maybe he tries to convince people this is all just, you know, religious mumbo jumbo. Satan doesn't really exist, right? Anyone ever see the movie? Um, oh, what was that one? I don't know. At the very end, uh, there's a quote Kaiser Sose. Anyone? Feed me. No one's seen the movie. You know it too, right? Anyway, at the very end, he says the, the, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled off, right? The greatest lie was convincing the world he didn't exist. Right? And that's been, hey, if you don't even think I'm real, then you don't even recognize that I'm the one who's, who's tripping you up. Th I'm the one who's lying to you. Right? Or if you don't think I have that power, that's my tactics, then I already got you. Because you're fully susceptible for me to get you wrapped around the axle. Right? I'll remember that later. <laughs> I'll remember that movie. Anyway, what about that there's no hell? Or that a loving God wouldn't send someone there? Right? That is an argument he uses all the time to people. What about the one that we humans were mostly good, right? Like we're just a little bit off. Um, how about you don't need to go evangelize. God will take care of it, right? You don't need to gather with other believers, right? You've got your internet. You've got your quiet time. You're good. You can forsake the gathering of the saints. Maybe he tr lies about God's character. God's not good, right? You can't trust him in this situation. Did he really lead you into this and this and this? Oh, now he's just going to abandon you? What kind of God is that? Maybe the spout, maybe the, the, the devil is saying, hey, you should trade in your spouse for a better model, right? Look at all the, look at all of it out there, right? That one seemed, we talked about that last week, right? Or what we even see here is that we start arguing with people directly instead of recognizing that our battle is against principalities, against dark forces, right, against the unseen realms, right? Like we're, we're, we're quarreling one with another instead of recognizing that there's an enemy stirring the pot behind the scenes. And, and it's like we're seeing so much through the physical eyes that we don't, we don't put our spiritual glasses on and recognize, wait a minute, maybe Satan is the one behind causing this division, Ephesians chapter four, right? Or maybe Satan's the one causing all the chaos that we see in our streets and our culture, the corruption, right? We get so mad at this party or that politician or that leader or whatever, right? Well, if they're not in Christ, they're likely working for our adversary. We need to recognize they're just a tool of that and be praying ap appropriately, right? 
truth is, guys, if we're writing things down, we are being lied to more than we're ever being told truth. Right? Let me say that again. Almost everything you hear that is being pushed out from our culture, which is not rooted in God's word anymore, is a half-truth, or even if it has some truth, it's got a lie baked in somewhere. And we've got to be very discerning. We've got to be wise, right? And perhaps some of the most dangerous media are the people that we think we're on our side, right? And, and they're telling us things that we want to hear instead of what we really need to hear. I'll tell you what, folks, uh, this, our nation, right, we're, we're in a spiritual battle. This isn't a political one. Amen? Um, so if that's true, then fellow humans are not our enemies. What did Christ say, right? Christ told us to love our enemies, right? We love them, we hate the sin. We love them, we contend against the spirit of darkness that's working through them. Amen? Next is it says we stand against the schemes of the devil. That's verse 11. And then again in verse 14, he says, stand therefore. So this is important when we're thinking about like military soldier type stuff, right? I think sometimes we get in this, this imagery in our mind, right? Like we're like Achilles, like in the movie Troy, like we're gonna run and like charge down and take down. Or Braveheart or, um, you know, Gladiator, any one of these movies. Right, where we get this, this imagery of fighting. But the truth is, what we are called to and directed by, instruction-wise, is stand. Guys, that is not an attack position, and it's not a retreat position. We, we are not to go try to hunt down the devil. There's nowhere in Scripture that says, hey, go, you know, go chase down the demons and whatever. No, they'll come find you. Be ready, Right? But when they come, you are also not to retreat. You are to stand firmly in the Lord, in his strength, having your armor on in all the things we're just about to go through, right? Um, this is a position of manning your post. It's not retreating under the lies. You defend and you stand your ground using the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Um, God has equipped us with everything we need to successfully fend off the schemes of Satan, the lies, the attacks, which Paul, in this language, he calls fiery darts, right? Fiery darts. Well, where does that imagery come from? Anyone have ever seen the movie Gladiator? Right at the very beginning of the movie, there's this opening scene where uh, the, the General Maximus is out there with the Spanish army, and they're fighting against basically the Germanic hordes is what they're called, right? And the Roman soldiers, they, they, they're getting ready to go into battle, and there's a line of fire that's put down. They dip the tip of their arrows in it, and they shoot arrows in front and in back on purpose to basically create fire to hold them in and also in front, right? So they're using fire as basically a way of controlling the terrain. Well, I also don't want to get hit by one of those darts, right? And he's saying, hey, be on guard, those darts. Well, what are those darts? Spiritually speaking, those are the lies. Those are the daggers. Those are, if we're using modern language, those are bullets. He's shooting deadly bullets at you, right? So we gotta stand firm. We, we, don't, we don't retreat. God's given us the right armor. And then how do we do this? This comes to the fifth point. Well, it says, having fastened on the belt of truth, okay? In, in the Greek language, like we, this makes no sense. So we translate this, but it actually, the Greek actually says, gird up your loins. Okay, it doesn't say put on the belt of truth. We translate that because that makes sense to us. In the original language, gird up your loins would be the following. Okay, most men wore basically tunics or robes, right? And this is so it would stay cool under in summer, right, everywhere. And then when it was time to go to work or to what? go to battle. There was a very specific way that what they would do is they would take off their belt and they would gird up their loins, right? Which basically meant they would take this and move it up to an appropriate height where now they were mobile. They were activated. They, they, they were free to use their strength and their mobility and their agility and all these sort of things to, to whatev whether it was working the field or hunting or actually fighting, right? And so Paul is saying quite literally, take off your robe and put on your work gear, right? Get ready. Or 
if you're wearing gear that is going to be like, quote, interchangeable, right? Get into the p posture or the position now where you're ready to be active. So it's a position of activation. He's saying put on the belt of truth, but specifically get ready, be prepared, right? Um, so you can see the image here, there's different points, and the end result, right, is it's tied up here, I'm ready to go, I'm now mobile, I'm now strong, I'm now agile, okay? There is a time to let it back down, right, and there's a time to bring it up, and that's what Paul wants us to um, understand. When he says the belt of truth, right, um, with that, that basically means those who, we are rooted in God, right? We're rooted in his word, we are rooted in the gospel. As Satan comes, to fire darts of lies at you, right? You don't just sit there and take them. You're gonna put on all this gar armor, but the first thing you gotta do is you gotta be mobile. You gotta be agile, okay? Next thing we look at is, and having put on the breastplate of, righteous, breastplate of righteousness, verse 14, right? Um, guys, one of the things that we see here is that the breastplate in, in olden times, right? This was a piece of armor that you would use to cover your internal organs. The idea is like, can you survive if a finger or an arm gets injured? Yes. Can you survive if your heart or your lungs, right, or something else gets pierced? Probably not. The fatality rate is really, really low. So protect that which is most important. And in most ancient civilizations as well as today, we, we understand kind of we've got the, our head and our heart, right, as like these these two things that are actual physical organs, but also it's how we describe the essence of who we are as humans, right? What happens in our mind, our soul, right? When we think about our soul, we think about our mind, we think about our will, we think about our emotions. We got what's happened in the mind, but our heart, I believe what Paul is saying here is protect your heart, right? It's the breastplate of, breastplate of righteousness. Protect having a right relationship with God. That's what righteousness means. Righteousness is having or being in a right relationship with God. Christ has done the heavy lifting of putting us in a right relationship with God. He's the one that bared the cross. He's the one that shed his blood. He's the one that conquered death and overcame the grave. Okay? But we need to protect our hearts because there's any number of other things that Satan will throw at us in the form of lies or temptations or whatever that will lead us into disobedience. And when we are led into disobedience, we now are in this place where we're not actually protecting our heart. And our heart will start to drift towards those things that we've been entrapped with, right? In the olden days, that was maybe what it looked like. In today, it's the same thing. The, 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 we've changed from fiery arrows or darts to bullets in our culture, but it's the same thing. You put on a bulletproof vest, because if you're gonna go into battle, you still have to protect right, this core area which is important. So the question maybe we're asking ourselves is, hey, am I protecting my heart, right? Or do I let culture or Satan or whatever speak into it? I, I, can't, I can't tell you guys, I, I, get, I get frustrated all the time. I, I reference movies um, because, and darn near every movie I reference is like one of the three I watched that year. Right? I, I don't really watch much TV. I don't listen to much secular music. Like I, I just don't have a lot of exposure. And the reason is I find every time I put that stuff on, it's basically laced with things that are trying to draw my heart away from God. I'm not saying there's not some good media and some good entertainment out there. So don't, don't, this isn't a legalism thing. I'm saying one of the things that I do purposely right, is I make sure to not let things that I know are loaded with basically lies and false values into my heart very often because I know my heart is corruptible. Even though I'm in Christ, my heart can still wander. All right, probably true for you as well. So breastplate of righteousness, I want to be in a right relationship with God. I did nothing to earn the status, but I need to work to preserve the position. And I what I mean by position is not my eternal status, but that like I'm not getting tangled up in lies that are gonna cause me to now trip over myself in disobedience and, and you know, uh, basically end up in the mire right, or injured. Next thing, um, uh, we, we go to, and as for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. This is a big theme in the New Testament, friends, right, is this idea of peace. Um, in Jewish culture, right, they very often greet each other with this word shalom, 
that basically meant like, I, 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 I wish upon you wholeness might be a, a good way to say it. You know, in Greek, the word translate basically almost the same. It's not wholeness, it's, it's oneness, right? And the idea is that you're of unity basically in your, in your entire being. And Paul very often uses this greeting because he obviously was Jewish and he brought this greeting into what he's bringing to the churches and, you know, often communicating in Greek. And the idea was, hey, I want the wholeness, right? The peace, the fullness, the unity that comes from being in Christ to be your very essence and experience, right? And that only happens to people that are in the gospel. Uh, show me someone who is apart from Christ you, th you can see, you can see, it. watch celebrities, right? They got all this money, they got all this beauty, they got all this fame. Are they at peace? Right? Very often the people at peace are the ones, most simply, that I got Jesus and that's enough. Right? He's trying to help them remember, don't worry, don't be anxious. Um, we see this in, in Romans chapter 8. Uh, he, he tells the church there, he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor present things or things to come or powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the things that Satan is going to try to do you is he's going to do you in is help you to think differently about the gospel than what it's really done for you. Right? If you were in Christ, you were secure. But he want the, the adversary, one of his weapons is to get you to feel rocky like you're not on stable ground. Right? And even the idea of sandals, right? We use the word shoes in some translations, sandals in other translations. But there are different types of shoes. Right, there's running shoes. I remember the first time I got a good pair of running shoes, I was like, holy smokes, my feet don't hurt after wearing these. Right, I was buying like the $30 Asics at Marshalls, and then I got like a $150 pair of like New Balances that were fitted for my running style. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't hurt anymore. I should have done this years ago. Right, like shoes make a difference. Um, same with soccer cleats. I played a lot of soccer. There's, there's cleats that are designed for mud. There's cleats that are designed for basically turf. There's cleats that are designed for wet conditions, right? For playing on like uh, almost like a basketball surface or like a, a carpet. You want to wear different equipment that is appropriate for whatever surface you're on. Uh, it's funny last night, total aside, but it ties in. It's like 7.30 last night and my daughter Kyla in the other room, she's heading out the door. This is for you too, Maya, right? She's literally in shorts no, she was in sweatpants, like right here. She's got her socks pulled up and she's in sandals. Like two straps over. Our garage is filthy at the moment and it's full of stuff, so she's parked out front where there's about four feet of snow, or sorry, four inches of snow. I'm like, Kyla, don't you think it'd be appropriate to put on shoes that when you walk out to your car that's in the snow, and she just looked at me like, you're so stupid, Dad, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I'm just going to my friend's house. It's no big deal. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't you put on the shoes like you're ready, the readiness, right? Like you're ready for something potentially to not go well. How do you think that conversation went for me? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> not too good, just shakes her head. Right? But sometimes we're the same way. Like God gives us the equipment. We're like, God, I know better. Right? I'll be fine. And he's saying, no, put on the whole armor. Put on the right shoes. Put on the ones that are firmly rooted and give you the traction to be able to stand your ground in Christ. Well, what is that? F wake up every single day and uh, be reminded and assured of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? You were a sinner dead in your sins, and he saved you. He loved you. There's nothing that Satan can do to separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. Jesus said, be anxious about nothing. Tomorrow has enough worries about its own. Take him at his word. He's got it. He takes care of the lilies in the field, and the birds of the air. Be anxious for nothing. Next, it says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith in which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. We just talked about this, right? Paul's using this imagery of how they used to fight battles. The shield of faith, okay? This goes into this idea then of don't worry, be anxious, which we just were moving into. Like these things kind of like layer on top of each other. We know in Romans 10, it says, faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God, right? So how do we put on the shield of faith? Well, we, we, we hide God's word in our heart. We read it. We meditate on it. We believe, we, we dwell on that which is true instead of filling our minds with what is loaded with bunk, right? In uh, Philippians chapter four, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always, I'll say it again, let your reasonable reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what? This, this sounds almost the same. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard what? Your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think sometimes when we think a shield of faith, we think of an image like this. Okay, and this is from the movie Gladiator. By the way, guys, I wanted to go watch this movie after preparing for this message. I'll put it on maybe tonight or tomorrow, <laughs> right? We think like, okay, I got this shield, I'm ready. Um, I don't think this is what Paul had in mind when he's telling them to put on the shield of faith. Remember when I started the series, one of the things I said is we have, an, we have a, a, a likelihood when we're, when we're receiving God's word into our language to personalize everything. Right, like we read the word you and we don't read you plural or y'all, we think you as in me individually, right? When he is giving this instruction to the church in Ephesus, there's a personal application, but he's talking to the church. He's saying, church, put on the armor of God collectively. You together are in a spiritual battle. Maybe better imagery would be something like this, right? We've all got our big shields together. We're getting ready. We're, we're in a spiritual battle. The Romans actually trained not just offensively, but they trained defensively, just like any good sports team was do, like know the rules of the game, know and understand the game, right? In a game where life and death is at stake, defense is really important. If you're trying to earn another sports contract in your basketball, you may not be worried about your teammates losing if you're getting enough points on the board so you can get a promotion, right? But if, you're, if, if your fellow guy next to you dies, that just upped your likelihood of not making it either, right? So defense was incredibly important. So they would work on these formations where basically when the fiery darts were coming in, it's like they created a wall, no big deal. Well, good. You can see even the next one there, right? They would set up in all these formations where they would use the shields appropriately. Anyone who understands military strategy, tactics, which I do not propose to be an expert at, right, the idea is that you've got to have your defensive game on. And when it comes to the shield, the shield of faith is basically, hey, I can take God at his word. We can take God at his word, right? We can do it. That is our shield of faith. and take the helmet of salvation, verse 17. Guys, this is, remember we talked about the heart, now this is the battlefield of the mind. If, if Satan can't corrupt our hearts, right, he will try to poison what's up here. The moment we place our trust in Jesus' death and resurrection on our behalf, uh, uh, and he's our Lord and Savior, right, we're saved. I mean, it's done, it's a finished work. However, this is the truth, guys, and this is kind of sad. I don't know why God did it this way. You can ask him when you're in heaven, or maybe I will, we all will, right? But the process of sanctification, the process of becoming more Christ-like is not really an instantaneous <coughs> moment, is it? Right, this is something that, that it's, it's a lifetime process, right? As God, uh, in John 15, right, we're gently pruned, right? He's removing the thistle and the underbrush and the different things that, that are unfruitful. Uh, it's a lifelong journey, and guess what? It's often difficult and very, very often discouraging, right? And we know in John 10.10, 10, Jesus even said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, right? Um, I remember when Katie and I were younger, uh, I've shared this before, we actually started, not intentionally, but we started believing, you know, bits of the prosperity gospel, and Satan, I believe, used God's word through gifted orators and speakers to speak things that were true and lace them together with things that weren't true, right? 
and what ended up really becoming the condition of our minds was something that was really, really tragic. And, and the question or the, the situation that I think many of us find ourselves in sometimes in one way or another is, God, if you really loved me, dot, dot, dot. God, if you really loved me, I wouldn't be dealing with my mouth struggling, right? God, if you really loved me, my marriage wouldn't be on the rocks. God, if you really loved me, I'd have more money. God, if you really loved me, I'd have that job now, right? God, if you really loved me, you'd heal me of this ailment, whatever it is, right? Jesus said in this life, you'll have many trials. You'll have many difficulties. You will have an adversary that wants, he's like a, he's like a lion who's prowling around ready to take you out, right? And yet somehow those, those things, those poison darts go into our mind and, and we start to think, if God really loved me, he'd give me more of what I want and what I think I need this side of earth. And what I was so convicted of, I remember just repenting and weeping when I finally realized, oh my gosh, what I'm actually telling you is that your shed blood on the cross was not a sufficient demonstration of your love for me. So we need to protect our minds. We need to put on the helmet of salvation, right? We need to remember the truth about who God is, what he's done, and what he says. Well, how do we do that? We get lastly to one of these last weapons, right? It's the sword of the spirit, right? Everything is culminating to this, which is basically what we started with. God, help us to be readers, knowers, doers, believers, right? Whatever it is of your word, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, verse 17, he's saying, have your sword ready. You guys, this is the only tool in the arsenal that is both defensive and offensive, right? We can strike back with the sword. And we notice, I already touched on this, that's exactly what Jesus did in the garden, or sorry, in, in the wilderness when Satan tempted him, right? He came, he parried it with his sword, and he, he retaliated with the sword. His weapon was not anything other than the word of God right back. But we got to know the word of God. We got to know how to use it. We got to know how to send it back. That's one of the reasons here at church, right? That's why we have our Sunday morning Bible study. That's why we have our Tuesday night Bible study. That's why we have our discipleship groups, right? It's that we would come together, build each other's faith, that we'd have the shields in lockstep together, right? That we would be studying his word so we know how to rightly handle and apply it to parry, right? And attack when necessary. Uh, famous evangelist Greg Laurie. Um, of Harvest Ministries, right? Harvest Crusades. Um, this is what he had to say about the sword. He says, when we are tempted, anyone here ever been tempted? <laughs> okay. So when temptation comes is what he's saying. The most effective weapon that God has given to us as believers is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus modeled this so beautifully during his temptation in the wilderness. When the devil tried tempting him, temptation after temptation, Jesus used the sword of the Spirit. When the devil tempted him three times, Jesus responded with the truth of God's word each and every time. Right? If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for what? For us, right? Um, interesting, this week, uh, this is kind of an interesting example to share, especially since this is, you know, on the internet. But here we go. <laughs> so I got a new firearm recently, and I put some optics on it, and uh, I was kind of playing around, and I got a safe to put it in. It's like a biometric. I touch my finger on it, pops open. There you go. And uh, Katie comes in, and she goes, uh, Ryan, she goes, what's the code to the safe? I said, I'm not telling you. And she goes, well, why not? What if I need to use it? I said, I've invited you multiple times to go to the shooting range so that I could train you how to shoot. So has my father. And not once have you taken me up on it. I'm not giving you the keys or the code to it because you're actually more likely to hurt yourself or someone inadvertently if you're not trained on it. Right? And she looks at me and she goes, <laughs> no, you're right, right? She thought about it, and logically, and, and the idea is the following, guys. Just having access to the, to the sword of the spirit is a good start, right? But we need to know how to rightly handle it. We need to know how to rightly divide God's word, right? 
Sam told me, my dad told me, I say right too much. I'm sorry if I do that. I'm trying to remember. It's even written right here, right? Okay. <laughs> I just realized I was doing it. Thank you, my dad. Thank you, Sam, for helping me. <laughs> <laughs> However, this, this, the spirit of what we're getting at here, right, is <laughs> 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 correct, <laughs> is the most effective tool that we have that God has given us to defeat the schemes which we've established come from the father of lies, which his weapon and fiery darts are what? Deception and lies, right? <laughs> Is to be able to know and defend using God's word. Friends, if we are not in God's word, if we are not studying it, we are not putting on the full armor of God. I heard a quote one time that said something effective, you know, seven days without God's word makes one weak. It's a play on words. You can think about it. <laughs> Last point here, guys, and then we'll uh, be moving in. Paul finishes by saying, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the gospel of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to. Friends, there's a few more things that we could go through in the interest of time. I just want to make this, this brief point on this. Nearly every Christian I know prays. I, know I even know believers. Oh, sorry, I was going to say this. I even know people who aren't Christians who pray. But to pray in the spirit is something entirely different. Meaning, if I sit down at a meal and I, and I go to God and say, God, thank you for your provision. That is a beautiful thing. It's an acknowledgement of God's goodness, of his common grace, of his provision for your family. But what is praying in the spirit? Right, praying in the spirit, you, you could get different interpretations of this and without getting into all the theological differences about all of that, I think in, it, in its essence and in its root, regardless of kind of your faith tradition, praying in the spirit could be summarized the following way, right? I'm going deeper in prayer than surface level. And I'm, I'm bringing prayers to God that are in alignment with his will. Or said another way, as I'm praying, I'm allowing my will to be conformed to his. So what Paul is saying is, don't just offer up gratitudes to God, but pray in such a fashion where your heart, your very essence, your mind, your heart, all that who you are is coming into alignment with God's word and with God's heart. There's no prescribed way, one way that we get there, but we pray with the intention of God, align my heart with yours. Align my perspective with your truth. So you'll see there at the end of the notes, friends, I, I put three questions, and these are the things I'd, I'd love you to just wrestle with this this week. Like, don't, don't just put this away. That's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Oh, that was a nice message. Let me go on to living the way I was and keep taking the darts, right? He wants you to put on the armor. So the questions are, which, which armor am I, are you using well? Be aware. Know your strengths. Know what, you're, what you what attributes come easily for you, right? Help your brothers and sisters next to you who, who that doesn't come so easy for. But also have an honest evaluation of which ones am I using, but I'm using poorly. Katie example, not just handing this over to be a liability, right? We wanna, we wanna be trained to use this well. Last one, which ones am I not even putting on at all? Which ones am I just forsaking? Just totally vulnerable. Maybe I don't have the shoes on. I'm, I'm slipping all over the place. I'm not at peace. Right? Maybe I'm not wearing the bulletproof vest or the breastplate of righteousness and I'm getting tempted into all sorts of things and falling over and over because I'm not protecting my heart. Spend some time thinking about that. Paul wraps up the letter this way. He says, So then, you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Guys, Tychicus is mentioned four times in the New Testament. He's one of Paul's companions. 
And what's going on here is Paul is basically saying, hey, the deliverer of this letter is our dear friend in common. He's been with you before when we planted the church and I'm sending him back to you. And he's the one hand delivering this letter that Paul's writing, right? And so I've given you apostolic instruction for your church. He's gonna fill you in on the rest of the details on how we're doing. And please do the same to him so that when, share with him how things are going so that those, those words get back to Paul. Should he still be alive? Because as it says, right, he's an ambassador in chains. And we know that it wasn't too long after this that he gave up his life. Tanner, we can go ahead and come up. Um, and those uh, leading communion, Dennis, Jim, um, we are gonna, we're going to do communion, guys. The last two verses in this letter that we worked through over the last few weeks says this. Paul sends his greeting. He says, peace be to the brothers and love with faith from the God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with love, and this is a very interesting word that he ends with, with love incorruptible. I almost got a tear. The last word in the letter to Ephesians is the word incorruptible. But a love that's incorruptible. Paul ends this letter as a love letter. Right? He loves his church. You can sense God's love for the church through Paul. It's coming from a place of affection. Right? It's rooted in the common love and faith they have in Jesus. Um, but he, he, he ends with this word incorruptible. And if we think about some synonyms there, it says it's a love that is not subject to decay. It's a love that's everlasting. It's a love that's imperishable. It won't go bad. It's a love that's unbreakable. It's a love that's indestructible. It's a love that's enduring. And since we're using military terminology here, right? It's a love that's undefeated and undefeatable. Victory has been secured by this love of Jesus for them and for us, church. In John 15, 18, Jesus is talking to his apostles, those he chose and called them to follow him. And he says, remember this. If the world hates you, if you sense the attacks of the adversary, remember they hated me first. That's what Jesus says. But before that, starting in verse 12, Jesus says, this is my commandment. Hey guys, go ahead and pass out the elements if you would. Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Exactly what Paul was reminding the church of in Ephesians 4 through 6. And this is what Jesus says. He says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And he says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. And then Jesus says this remarkable phrase. He says, for all that I have heard from the Father, my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus says, hey, I haven't, the things that God has given me to share with you, I have not held back. I've given you what you need to know. And it's all rooted in the Father's love and my love for you. Friends, while we're waiting for the elements to be passed out, maybe just bow your head and, and just process for a minute. God, thank you. Right? Just process that great love that he's given you and that he's called you friend.
if you would. <coughs> if you have <coughs> entrusted your life to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, meaning you've trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins, right? You don't put any hope in your own goodness, but in his alone. And your life is truly surrendered, meaning you, you say, God, not my will, but your will be done. Right, if you've, if you've tru truly chosen that pathway, then the Lord invites you to remember him through communion. Remember his what? His great love and sacrifice for us. So guys, if you would take the bread, and as you're putting this in your mouth, Lord, and, and as you're, you're processing, as you're eating it, be dwelling on this fact. The Lord has such an indestructible, imperishable, unbreakable love for you, right? That even though his body was broken and defeated and buried, it was raised to life for you. As we take the the, the fruit juice, the wine. There's a song by Chris Tomlin that says, God's love ran red. Just have a brief conversation with God Almighty and just thank him that his love ran red and that it's undestructible, imperishable. Lord, we thank you for this time together this morning. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for our journey through the letter to the Ephesians. Lord, I pray for our church right here that we would be strengthened in Christ. Lord, that we would walk in light and in love as you've called us to. Lord, that we would gird up our loins and to be ready for the, for the battle that we didn't choose but nevertheless we're in. Lord, may we remain strong and stand firm in your strength and put on the full armor of God. Lord, we, we commit ourselves unto your service and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Church reminder that there's a business meeting right after this. (laughs) 